Thanks everybody for joining us. Welcome. This is a special edition of our Global Connections. My name is Jason Camillo and I'm from the Office of Global Initiatives at Berkeley. I'm joined this evening by my colleague, Associate Director Amanda Goldthorpe, and we're um, co-hosting this amazing session for you. And uh, we've got some really cool people with a great topic uh, to dig into today. This is a Zoom meeting, so we're all kind of in the same space. So if we can just be mindful, Zoom rules are going to apply. You know, we'll have a Q&A section later on. So if you could at the beginning, you feel free to just keep yourselves on mute. You know, but please turn on your cameras. We'd love to see your faces and see who you are. Um, as we get in, if you don't mind, in the chat, um, would you just drop in like where you're where you're reaching out to us from? You know, let us know who you are. If you're a musician, let us know what you play, what instrument, or if you're a vocalist and what kinds of music you're into. It'd be good for us to know who you are. Um, the session is going to be recorded and we will put it up online afterwards. So if you'd like to go back and, and take a listen to it and watch it, you'll be able to do that. Also, if your friends, colleagues or students missed the session, um, you know, please let them know they'll be able to go and check it out as well. Um, my hope is that this is probably maybe the first in a series um, on this topic, working with the students of Caribbean ancestry at Berkeley College of Music. Um, this is a really interesting group doing great work and um, and the music that we're digging into is super important as is this topic. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, our host for this evening. She's a fantastic saxophonist. She's an upper semester student at Berkeley. She's getting ready to graduate. Um, she's an award-winning musician music educator, a uh, versatile musician playing many different styles of music, but um, known for playing jazz, gospel, um, pop, R&B, and, um, and she's also classically trained. Um, she recently was the recipient of the Bill Pierce Martin Luther King Scholarship at Berkeley College of Music. And so please join me in welcoming um, Ariana Stanbury. Ariana, turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to come out and be with us this evening. I'm really excited for this discussion and I'm just really looking forward to the kind of knowledge and insight that we all will gain from this conversation. Um, so before we get started, I just want to introduce the other two incredible organizers alongside me. Um, we have Jason Camillo, the Vice President of the Berkeley Global Initiatives, and two incredible Berkeley alumni by the name of Sophia Leslie and Evad Campbell. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves really quickly, and then we'll introduce the panelists and jump straight into this conversation. All right, I guess I will go first. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Sophia Leslie. I was the founder of SOCA Students of Urban Ancestry, and I am a vocalist. I represent Trinidad and Jamaica, and I'm currently an entrepreneur as well. So nice to have you guys here. Hi, everyone. My name is Ivad Campbell. I am a Jamaican keyboardist and arranger. I got accepted to Berkeley in 2017, and I will be officially graduating this year in a couple, a couple of weeks, actually. I'll be officially graduating from Berkeley. Um, I majored in uh, contemporary writing and production. And yeah, that's pretty much me. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So we're going to introduce the panelists right now. Sophia, do you want to get us started? All right. So first up, we have Joseph Davis, who is a qualified award-winning Jamaican-British musician, a multi-instrumentalist, and at the tender age of 18, with perfect hits and chromathesia, Joseph is the first person in Jamaica to ever achieve a distinction in the ARSM diploma exam. Joseph plays a variety of instruments, including but not limited to piano, bass, drums, vocals, djembe, and guitar. He currently attends the Idleworld Arts Academy in California, and he will be a songwriting, oh, he's currently a songwriting minor, but he's also going to be attending Berkeley in the fall as a contemporary writing and production major in September 2021. So welcome, Joe Davis. Othniel Lewis. 
So Otto Neil Lewis, but most popularly known as Otti, is a Jamaican, a Jamaican keyboardist, producer, and musical director, and has been an independent professional in the music industry for many years. Otti has toured the world with Grammy-winning artists such as Shaggy and Jimmy Cliff. He has also worked with renowned musicians and artists such as Monte Alexander, Kevin Downswell, and many other Jamaican artists, renowned Jamaican artists. Today, Oti can be seen on stage as the musical director for the season five winner of The Voice, Tessan Chin. He, is established, he has established a successful career over the years as a multifaceted musician and continues to make his mark as one of Jamaica's most respected musicians, whether in studio or on stages around the globe. Please make Oti feel welcome. Hi. <laughs> Michael Sean Harris. After being granted a scholarship to pursue a dual major in contemporary writing and production and music synthesis, well now known as electronic production and design, at Berkeley College of Music's Boston campus, Sean Harris graduated and was contracted as the lead male vocalist for Holiday on Ice in concert, which opened in Paris in 2000 and toured Europe for three years. Today, Michael Sean Harris is a primary consultant with Digital Rising Stars where he is a performance coach and he can also be seen regularly on television as one of the judges on the Telev Television Jamaica High School Choir Competition show, All Together Sing. He works as the assistant director for the School of Music at the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts, where he has also taught pop ensembles, jazz voice and jazz harmony and co-written a music technology course, sorry, for the college's degree program. Michael is also the co-founder of the Ashe Company in Jamaica, which is one of the leading performing arts companies in the English-speaking Caribbean. Please make Michael Shanghai feel welcome, everybody. Okay. And last but not least, we have Ashley Kiko. Um, Ashley is an incredible up-and-coming saxophonist, composer, singer-songwriter, and entrepreneur who has studied classical piano Alto saxophone, and she has taught from uh, she has taught music for many years. Um, Ashley is also performed at major venues, including the Apollo Theater in New York City, and Wollongong University in Australia. And Ashley has also performed for the Steve Harvey National um, TV game show called Family Feud. Ashley received her master's in music and music education at Teachers College, Columbia University, and alongside her roles as a performer music educator and music advocate. Ashley is the founder of her own music academy, Kiko Studios, located in New York. So please help us welcome Ashley. Hi, everyone. Awesome. OK, let's jump straight into this conversation, because I know I'm excited, and I think everyone else here is super excited. So panelists, I have a question for you. How important is it for a Caribbean musician to know his or her history as a creative in the industry? You can feel free to jump in and answer. Okay, let me let me start <laughs> because I have a, I have a passion about this one. Um, I'm I'm very much into um, Jamaican folk music, you know, because there's there, there's such uh, 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 a wealth of it, and and I know that throughout the Caribbean, that's that's a similar story. And I think when you know your history, um, when you know where the things are coming from, you know what has influenced you, even if, if it hasn't influenced you directly, um, it provides you with a, a palette um, that you have to for creation. You know, there's all these things you have available to you that you can, you can infuse in whatever you're creating. Even if what you're creating doesn't sound like the typical thing from wherever you're from, you have all of these things, these rhythms, these melodies, these, these, um, these languages, these, these uh, inflections that are available to you to create a sound that is unique. So, yeah. I'd also like to add to that, um, that it really liberates and gives creative license as, as, Michael, would, as Michael was saying. Um, by knowing who you are, knowing where you are from, knowing exactly, okay, what are the roots of these things that I am feeling, you know, you kind of get a little bit more liberated 
to just go and just express yourself, right? Understanding now and really blending your cultural essence along with the creative, the, the, the new stuff. So you're blending your culture with whatever new thing you are feeling and stuff. Yeah. Uh, also, also, I'd like to add as a studio person now, um, that kind of gives almost a little intangible element of a connectivity, a hard connectivity with your audience, with your population, you know, with, 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 with the people of your culture to know that, okay, here it is, I am doing something and this thing, this particular rhythm will connect with this group of people, right? On a spiritual level, on an emotional level. So it is very, very, very important. And it's also important, sorry, I'm talking too much. It's also important to understand um, <laughs> understand your prop, understand um, where your music, the developments in the industry of your music, right? To see exactly where you are, to understand the mistakes, understand the wins, understand the losses, to move forward. That's it. If if I can just jump in quickly, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to hug the the, the microphone, but um, but I, I think sometimes as Caribbean people and, and, and as Jamaicans, we think, oh, we're, we're from this small dot in the ocean. And sometimes when we move throughout the world, um, we, we might feel that we, we, we don't have a place, um, you know, apart from where we're from. But the truth is, you know, the, the, that there's so much that has happened that, that has come, and we're gonna talk about this eventually, I know from the other questions that you want to ask. But when you're aware of, of, of where you're from and also the influence that, that your culture has has put out in the rest of the world. Um, it gives you um, a bit more confidence, I would say, a bit more confidence to say, oh no, this is, this is I'm a part of this tradition and, uh, and, and I can move this tradition forward. And I belong here, wherever I am, it could be at home or somewhere else. I belong here and my contribution is, is important and it's, it's valid and it's valuable. Lovely. Thank you for the input. Ashley, would you like to jump in on this one? Sure, sure. Um, I guess to kind of piggyback on what they were saying without repeating, because you guys said it beautifully, but um, I feel like it really gives me at least, and I'm sure other people, a, a true sense of pride. I think when you know um, you know, who your people are, where you're coming from, and, and just the history and the heritage, it just gives you such uh, a sense of pride to, to know that you're contributing to such an amazing legacy. Awesome, beautiful. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, so I have another question for you guys. How can you best describe the impact that Jamaica's sound has had on the international sound of today's pop music? A very broad, a very broad question. So many different angles you can take it from. Okay, since, since there's silence, I'm gonna jump in again. And if, if I'm talking too much guys, just tell me shut up. Okay, so, <laughs> so I mean, apart from, apart from the, 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 the reggae, you know, the, that, that pop music that everybody knows and the dance hall, you know, there's, there's certain aspects that you can hear, you know, um, in, in, the, in the development of the reggae music where, where Scratch Perry was experimenting with, with reverbs and delays and, you know, and, and with the dub sound and what that, what, you know, how that has influenced electronic music in several genres within that area of electronic music, you know, that, that um, I guess what they call the dembo rhythm. But for, for me, it, it, it came from when I, when I heard, um, when I heard reggaeton first, I was like, oh, but that's Murder, She Wrote, you know, Murder, She Wrote, you know, so I was like, oh, and then, you know, that became Mumbaton, that became, you know, all these other things that that rhythm is still there and they call it tropical, what what do they, what do they call it, tropic something, tropic house or, you know, something like that. Tropical so, house. Or something yeah, like tropical that. house. So, so that rhythm is, is there. I mean, it's not... It, Clearly, it's not just Jamaican. I mean, you can hear that those rhythms in in other parts of the Caribbean and in Africa and and and, and South America and some other places. But but you know that's that's what sparked it. You know that song and and that rhythm is what sparked this you know this explosion of other things, other ideas, other things growing, cropping up because of it. So um, I, and even the thing of of a, of a rhythm or or you know having that same 
um, music bass and then you put in, putting other songs on it. That's a that's a that's a Jamaican thing that became something else, you know. So um, it's 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 vast and it's and it's important to recognize it. The influence on hip hop, you know, with the turntablism, with 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 um, Cool Herc and stuff, you know, all those things that you have to. It, so for, for me, I mean, a lot of people don't know this, and a lot of people a lot of people from the culture don't know it. So for me, it's important for them to know it, so so that that what we spoke about in the first question can happen. You know, this this identity, um, you can kind of start to form a, a, a bigger sense of your identity. And no, I'm talking too much. Good. If I could just jump in here, um, I feel like Jamaican music definitely has a significant um, influence on popular music because with songs like, for example, like Drake's Controller, um, dancehall is just the cornerstone of that song. And so there are so many examples of that in popular music nowadays, and people don't necessarily realize that that is where it is. It's more of a subconscious um, knowledge. And so people tend to overlook the fact that all of that is coming out of our country. And it's, it's, it's something that really should be pushed and should be recognized a lot more. And it's not just with Controller. There are so many other songs that I could think of that are built off of this main backbeat that comes from this country. And it's just sort of a subconscious thing that I think people need to start realizing a lot more and start thinking about. And it's, it's a lot of like the reggae fusion and stuff like that that's making the mainstream market nowadays. And I'm seeing it a lot more with a bunch of different artists, a bunch of different genres and um, so forth and so on. So it's something that <clears throat> I feel should really be highlighted and something that I feel we as Jamaicans should be really, really proud of. Absolutely, I agree. An emphasis on the word overlooked as well. I definitely think that more credit can be given there. Ashley, do you wanna jump in and say anything? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, yeah, just, I, I definitely feel such a, a huge sense of pride just knowing how much, you know, Jamaica's influence has, has influenced, you know, pop culture today, not just music, but fashion and, and you know, the way that, that the music is expressed, the way the music is performed, um, it's just, you know, you see it in a lot of music today, especially, you know, when you guys bring up the rhythms and how, you know, you can have so many different melodies over the same beat, the same bass line. And I think it's just like a tremendous uh, display of creativity. For me personally, I've tried to, you know, make my own uh, melodies over these rhythms, but it, it's definitely tricky because you get so used to hearing other melodies and um, you just have to be really creative to come up with something different over that. And so, you know, it's just a tremendous display of, of creativity that I think other people have used in different genres of music, even if it doesn't necessarily, you know, sound like the Jamaican reggae, but the ideas as well, the form of the music is also reflected in other genres. Beautiful, thank you for sharing. And while we're on you, Ashley, I have a question specifically for you. How has your experience as a Jamaican woman alto saxophonist impacted you positively or negatively in the music industry? So I'm really blessed to say that it has all been positive. Um, I think, you know, not everyone is able to say that, but, you know, so far my, my whole career, it has been very positive. Um, I would say just being a woman in general has, um, you know, it has its, its setbacks, I guess you can say. Sometimes people, um, you know, they don't have as high expectations for you and your ability when, when they see a woman, especially playing the saxophone. And so, you know, a lot of times I've gone to performances and people, you know, I'll have maybe people helping me with my things and they think that the other people carrying the instruments are, are the people who are performing or sometimes they'll just you know kind of dismiss me and be like oh okay you're you're going up okay that's great and then once i get off the stage then that's when people are like oh my gosh <laughs> and you know you can just kind of tell and you can kind of hear in people's reaction that they don't expect much 
So of, of course it's great to get those reactions, but once you hear the surprise, you just know that they initially didn't expect as much. So um, I think that that's more so in line with just being a woman in the, in the music industry. Um, but specifically being Jamaican, I feel, you know, like I, I, I keep mentioning a great sense of pride, but I, um, you know, my father's side of the family, they all migrated from Jamaica and I just feel so, um, you know, just thankful that they, just for everything that they've done. And so I just love representing Jamaica and, you know, playing reggae and reggaeton, so. <laughs> Thank you for that insight. Thank you for adding that. And to add to what you were saying, also as a, a Jamaican woman, alto saxophonist, I know a comment I get a lot when I show up to my performances is, oh, are you the guest vocalist? Or I'll get asked, um, or I'll be told, you know, you're the first woman that I've ever seen play a saxophone or blow that thing. So I definitely can relate to that when you when you kind of say that there's this kind of surprise that comes with the responses. But at the same time, it's kind of empowering because like once you get off that stage, then you can walk off feeling so empowered and say like, you know, I really just represented myself and my purpose and my entire country on that stage. It's beautiful. Awesome. Okay, so another question for all the panelists. Uh, what messages, if any, do you individually choose to highlight through your platforms? Okay, I'll go first. Um, I am very weak when it comes on to the platforms thing. My platform is basically personal, right? I'm starting up my band platform. I'm, the, I'm one of the old guys, right? Um, but my personal message has been more of travels, that kind of thing, and just encouraging people. And that's it. You know, I find some nice clips. I find Joe and all of you guys, and I just put it up there and say, look at this, guys. These kids are killing, you know? Um, yeah. I, th I think, and just to give more context to the question, um, I think it, it more relates to um, not if, even if it's not your, your personal life or social media but what is like your, your mindset when creating in the studio or you know, when you're about to deliver a performance as a soloist, a vocalist, a saxophonist, um, what is your mindset? Why, what keeps you, you going? What keep, what's your drive when, um, when doing this whole music thing? Um, that, so that could also uh, give more context to, to the question. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I really like to use my platform for kind of what we were just talking about, just really inspiring women. Um, I just think it's so important to, you know, rep, you know, represent myself in a professional way, um, in a respectful way as well, and just show women that they can also, you know, play an instrument. But not not only that, um, also just kind of be in the limelight and do it in a respectful way. I feel like a lot of women uh, musicians and singers, rappers, a lot choose to go down a different path and be a little bit more promiscuous, I guess you can say. Uh, but I definitely like to show, you know, a different side of being an artist and, and being someone who, you know, has a platform to inspire others. Uh, I um, think, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no worries. Um, I was just going to say, um, I, well, I spent the first few years of my life in London, England, but I am a proud Jamaican. And I kind of wanted to show people that reggae and dancehall aren't, although they are a core part of Jamaican culture, they aren't the only thing that comes out of Jamaica. Like Jamaicans aren't just limited to these two genres of music. While they are incredible genres of music, it's not just that that we do. And so I'm trying to like reach out to as many genres as I can with jazz, R&B, um, you know, soul and all of these different um, types of things. And I'm trying, to just, I'm trying to bring to light the fact that Jamaicans aren't just limited to that. And also 
I try to fuse Jamaican music with popular music nowadays with like my reharmonizations and arrangements and so on. Um, I do try to incorporate like Yamentos, Yaska, all these things into my arrangements to try and show people, oh, this is a different spin on a song that they know in a certain way that they haven't heard before. And that way is Jamaican. And so it's just, it just goes to show that our music is really, really diverse and our musicians are diverse and they can play up to a wide, wide, wide range of things. And I just want to bring light to that around the world. Yes, sir. I, I think um, for, me, for me, there's there's a few different levels. I mean, for me, there's there's a, there's a I don't, I'm not sure what the word would be. I don't know if it's a spiritual message, but it's a message of, of connectivity, of, of, um, of everyone being a part of everyone else in some in some way, shape, or form, regardless of what their language is or what they look like or where they're from, and I think I, I tend to try and put that in some of my music uh, and some of the things that I put out, um, and and also a thing of an idea that that anything and everything is possible. Um, you know, you just need to you just need to try it. Uh, uh, so the the other thing that that part of that now is is similar to what what Joe does. I. I, I, as I said before, I'm very much into the Jamaican folk music. And so what I've been doing um, with a lot of the stuff that, that I've been putting out is recontextualizing the folk music with, with a base of electronic music. So there's different, either with the textures or, or the beats or the rhythms. So doing some different things or, or with the technology that I use to perform it, you know, whether it's a, a harmonize or, a, you know, live looping or whatever. So I've been doing stuff like that um, to recontextualize it. And beyond that, it's just sharing people's people's stories. You know, there, there's lots of people who have done some really cool things that you don't know about. So, like, I started a podcast last last February, and so I've been sharing diff different people's stories and sharing stuff about the history of some of the folk music uh, on on different episodes of the podcast of the podcast. So, for me, that that those things are passions of mine, and that's what I that's what I tend to put out on my on my platforms. Thank you All for right. sharing that. Oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. What's it, you were saying something? Okay. Oh, I'm not saying anything. You can go ahead. Okay, no, well, I was just adding um, with a clarification that my music has over the years been really about healing. Um, so I kind of just put that vibe in it and understand that, okay, it is coming from a Jamaican perspective, right? Um, I've been blessed to, to go between, go from Monte Alexander, to work from Monte Alexander and Ernie Wrangling to Shaggy and all of them. Um, so I kind of blend a little bit of all of that experience, a little bit of all of that, and just put your heart and soul in it and just try to heal the world, <laughs> literally, mm -hmm. yeah. Love that, love that. Nice. And also, Sophia and Evad, if you guys want to jump in and answer this one as well, that'd be greatly appreciated. Just so that we can get like a student's perspective, I can, um, I can go first really quickly and then you guys can share. I know for me personally, an important message that I try to include in my artistry and my musicianship, it's kind of related to what Michael mentioned, um, just like sharing stories and kind of sharing my story and my personal testimony like within my music. And I know for me, it's just super important adding to what Ashley said to advocate for black women, um, advocate for the protection of black women. And that just looks so many, like it looks um, different when it comes to different people because everyone's stories are so different, um, but it also can just be so beautiful. And another thing I really try and do consistently is to just speak out um, against different forms of oppression that not just Black women face, but us as Black people face overseas, especially as Jamaicans internationally living in the United States, and just trying to like be an advocate through my music, if that makes sense. That's just an important message I try to incorporate. I'll go next. Um, I think just being a musician, I start like everything I do, I try and teach people that music is universal. It doesn't matter what language is being spoken, what rhythm is being played, what tempo it's being played at. 
if it speaks to you, it speaks to you. I started a whole business recently about this whole concept of, you know, world musicians traveling through music. And everybody just gets amazed at how a person could be singing in Malagasy or in Swahili or in, you know, Cantonese or any of these languages, and they still feel this emotional effect. So the message that I try to bring and when I sing in all these languages are the business that I do is that no matter what you're doing, if you're doing music, you're, you're speaking to someone, you're reaching someone, you're touching someone's life. And then on top of that, I also, as a musician, I believe just like Ariana, like if we have a voice, we use it. So I'm very about like, if there is something happening in a different country, everybody should be aware of this and I'm gonna do my best to share it. If something is happening in a region of the world I have never been to, like, you know, there's so many different things happening, refugees crisis, um, the thing that just happened with St. Vincent, people don't know these places, but it's important that us as artists, we showcase what is happening in the world so everybody can be engaged and know that they can possibly to help. So that is, the message that I like to share. Nice. For, for me, um, I'd like to really tie into, for example, when, when Bob Marley, when he was, you know, making reggae be known around the, the world, um, the one thing he was able to do, um, obviously reggae wasn't, very, reggae was really established internationally. One thing he was able to do is to, to bypass bypass culture, bypass language, and just bring everyone together um, through his music. Then not necessarily understanding some of the part of what I'm saying, but just the vibration and his vibe and energy that he brought around the world, connected people, regardless of the age, regardless of you know, where they're from. Um, so that's one of the things of Bob Meyer that really has inspired me um, over the years. And that's something that I try to do as well, um, just bringing good vibes um, wherever I am with the music, especially uh, when I started Berkeley, it was just so amazing to see that we're from is that mostly an inter international um, school for so people from different countries come together, um, just playing music. And once we're together, it's like we know each other from a long time because we can relate so well just through the power of music. So for me, it's just always um, you know, it's being, being a good human, spreading love, um, positivity, and uh, one thing Safia said is important is bringing awareness to what's going on going on in the world with music. You can do that as well. So, yeah, that's that's my sentiments. Awesome. Thank you both for sharing. OK, we have one more question, then we're going to go into a short question and answer section um, with the audience. So the last question for the panelists. What do you think the future sound of Jamaica will be and how do you think it will impact the international music scene? And also, are there ways in which you are currently innovating that are contributing to this future sound? Hmm. I guess I'll say something. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really hard question to answer because <laughs> there's really no way of us knowing what the future sound of Jamaica will be. And I think, you know, music has really just transformed so much from, you know, just a few years ago, if you think about it, just even in, in America, just thinking about the music from a decade ago, it's so different compared to what we're hearing now. So, you know, I, I, I would just say, I don't really have a, a clear answer, but um, a way that I'm trying to contribute to the future sound is just by, you know, being as creative as possible. I, um, you know, recently released my debut album. It's called Pursuit of Harmony. And thank you. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I always try to go back and listen to some of the, the music that I love and, and try to incorporate some of those sounds into, you know, original music that I'm writing today. And, you know, just always try to, to represent, you know, where I'm coming from with the new music. So I just wanted to say something real quick that came to mind. I just find it very interesting um, of the cycle of how our music has innovated and how it's continuing to innovate. Because for example, ska and rocksteady and reggae really came from influences of 
in American music, R&B, um, blues, and such on. Um, now, back in the late 70s, we you know, developed our own sound. And now, presently, the music that, as a young person that I'm hearing now, is really, it's a lot of, I guess, trap. They, they call it trap, trap dance or trap reggae. So I just wanted to throw it out there. It's, it's very interesting how, how the music has, you know, evolved that way. First, we get the influence and then we'll find our own, bringing a little, little bit more the influence. So I think really what's going to happen is that we're going to realize, all right, what the people really love and what, what really works is our roots, the heavy bass, the heavy drums, and more of that going to, to come in. And I hear Joe Davis, Michael, um, talking about their fusion as well. So I really, I feel like it's just, it's like a, like a washing machine, you just, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd definitely like to add on to that really quick that mm -hmm. you had mentioned those things. And the first thing when I heard that question that came to mind was like Afrobeat and trap are definitely influencing Jamaica's pop culture right now in terms of, you know, we went from dance hall, you know, we started dance hall and we started the fashion like, um, um, someone had said earlier, I think it was Ashley, we started the fast and we started the vibe, we started this whole flex that the whole international scheme wanted to like jump on, but they they, they don't have a style, but they still wanted to be a part of it. Now with Afro, we kind of doing the same thing with the dances and stuff. So it's like this beautiful mend of the two, you know, these two beautiful cultures. It's like we're going, like we, we've had said, back to our roots. And so I definitely agree with Yvad in terms of like, yeah, this stuff is fun. We're going to do some vibing with, you know, mass up, mass up things. But then we're always going to go right back home. <laughs> That's where we always end up going. So, yeah. Um, the, the, a few things came to mind. Um, what, one, one thing, the first thing that came to mind was, was uh, uh, I guess it's a part of the culture in, in Jamaica when like, we, we will create something and then it'll be great. And then we create something new and forget the thing that we just created. Uh, you know, and, and someone that like we, you know, Ska came about and it was awesome. It was a nice vibe for a few years. And then, you know, you know, Rocksteady and, and other things came on. And then England took over Ska and America took over Ska and, and innovated it a bit as well. You know, and Ska became other things, you know, like punk and that kind of stuff. And then, um, you know, the, 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 the different things, reggae for a time, you know, it was kind of, you know, nobody wanted to hear about reggae because dance hall was around, you know, and then it kind of, you know, because of the popularity in the rest of the world with reggae, it, it came back home, you know, and people started to go, oh, no, but but they're taking over our thing. So, <laughs> you know, that we, we have to, we have to, we have to be in charge of this, you know, kind of thing, but you can't be in charge of, of sound. So, um, but, you know, the, but they started again to, to, to pay attention to it and to do more with it. And the thing is that the sounds and the styles are going to recycle, you know, it goes with, with information. Um, before it wasn't internet, you know, it was people were on ships and they were shipping records and the blues records were coming and that, you know, they'd play the, the sound systems and those things. But now, you know, people are, are, are performing online and everybody's hearing everything. And so they're gonna take what they like from here and there and everywhere, and they're gonna put it into what, what, they're, what they're creating as they feel, you know? So for, for me, what I'm doing with the fusion again, part of the reason I'm doing that is because there is, as I said, all this, all this wealth, this re these resources that we have, and a lot of people kind of because it's old, you know, they go up. Oh, eh. So I'm I'm repackaging it in a way so they go, oh, but that's that's ours and that sounds cool. I could use this rhythm or I could, oh, that phrase is nice or oh that you know that thing is cool. Let me let me throw that in because sometimes when I create, I go I go overboard and do certain things in in a you know kind of avant garde sometimes. But you know, but the, the point is for it to 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 um, be a kind of an airworm for someone, and they go, oh, well that's cool. Um, but I'm doing a dance hall song, but let me use this little sample, or let me use this thing and include it. So it's, it's so it still keeps the thing alive. So for me, um, I, for me, that's that's where the future is. You know, it's it's trying to find this balance uh, of 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 not discarding what we what we made already for what we were just creating, but to be able to 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 keep everything on par, you know, other people do it, but you know, to 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 to, to have this respect for the for the scale as much as dancehall, as much as reggae, as much as the people who are doing rap in Jamaica, the people who are doing rock, and there are quite a few of them, and the people who are doing the fusion things, you know, it, it, that's for me is the future. 
Okay, yes, I agree with you, Michael. I agree with you 100%. Um, I think that music will continue because of the morphing of cultures, because of the internet and all of that, music will just continue to morph and morph and morph. The different cultures will just keep on coming together, right? Um, yes, I, I, I agree that there is this cycle and we know Jamaicans stay. Um, Jamaicans, once you hear something, once there's a new trend, you know, I mean, back in the day, I, I don't know who can remember, but back in the day, it was dancehall, 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 until somebody came back and did a one drop tune, right? And then it's just one drop and it's not even roots. Everybody just said one drop, you know, right? Um, so Jamaicans tend to be like that, unfortunately. Right, um, but the thinkers will morph. The thinkers will go and, and you're going to experiment and you're going to go through and keep on doing what you're doing. As for me, um, I will, well, I already experiment. I don't have anything much out. Um, I'm producing a lot of people and stuff and will do my own work. Um, but for me, the trick, the trick to it, as Michael was saying, is finding the balancing act, right? How much of another culture will tip the scale, you know? And who says, well, do we need to have a scale anyway, you know? But if we don't have a scale, you know, how do we maintain our Jamaican nest, right? How do we maintain our Caribbean nest? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about our culture and its impact on pop culture, right? So there needs to be a balance you know and for the different shades for the different you know it's all good all expression is good everybody just bust out and do what you do and enjoy on yourself right it's all good <laughs> i think i just want to add one more thing onto that um agreeing with everybody and as to not repeat what anybody said but um I do want to say that although there is this washing machine effect that we're seeing continuously happen with um, music coming after Jamaica, I think no matter how off axis the washing machine is, there are still core elements of that Jamaican music that you will hear in everything. And that's just something that we have in our culture that we can, even if we try to lose it, we couldn't lose it. And that's just because it's just so ingrained into the way that we make music. And with producers such as like Ayatosh and JLL and Izzy and all of these things, like they are finding ways to incorporate like new world music and so forth and so on. Um, and they're incorporating that into the core root Jamaican um, music and Jamaican culture. And they're able to share that with the world. And then the world hears and they're like, oh, you know, this actually sounds kind of decent. And then word of mouth and then everybody hears it and all of these kind of things. So I feel like Jamaican music is definitely there is that washing machine effect but I think we still are able to come back and we're still able to fall back on our core culture and our core like your, your drum and bass and all of these things so I think it's something really important to remember as we move forward in music to just make sure that we keep that there as well we can't lose it but just to remember that I, I have this, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I'll just say it quickly. I have this theory and I, I, you know, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. I haven't tried to prove it right or wrong as yet, but my theory <laughs> is that no matter what music there is, if there's one element that you've added to it, that sounds Jamaican, um, whether it's the language that you're, that you're using or, or the, or the style of the vocal, or is it a reggae bass line? It's going to sound Jamaican. It could be, it could be, you know, it could be, um, it could be Bach and then there's a reggae bass line. It's going to sound like reggae, um, it, you know, or it, it, it could be a, you know, an aria and, but it's in Patois and, 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 you know, the rhythm is, is different. It's going to sound like a dance hall song with classical music behind it. So, I mean, I haven't proven it right or wrong, but that's, it's been knocking around in my head. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you again to the panelists for just taking the time to be here tonight and for sharing. Um, I just want to open up the floor really quickly before we close out. We're a little bit behind, but I just want to have a, a short question and answer time um, with those attending today. So if you're interested in asking 
any questions for the panelists about anything they may have stated this evening or maybe um, a question about them personally and their artistry and their musical journeys, feel free to do so at this time. You can write a question in the chat and I can read it. Or if you want to unmute yourself, just use the raise hand feature um, and raise your hand and then I'll call on you and you can ask a question. Uh, so at this time, feel free to, to ask a question if you're interested in doing so. Um, Joelle, you can feel free to unmute. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, so my question is, so I'm a, I'm in school right now doing music education, doing my practicum. And one of the major struggles that I've had with my students, I'm not sure if any of the panelists can help me with this, but this lack of appreciation for or kind of music and i i'm not quite sure if there's like a way that you could suggest you know keep like just watching how the panelists talk about her music with this sense of excitement and joy and pride how do you pass that on to you know younger children and teenagers to keep that energy going so that you know when we all die the cult well i don't think the culture will ever die you know but how do you get that excitement even if they're not singers even if they never want to play an instrument but just that kind of appreciation how do you recommend you know keeping that passion there as jamaicans can i <laughs> uh, okay so for me i mean first of all i think you need to have that passion if you're gonna share it because if you don't have it you're not gonna share it so the, uh, the other thing is to is when you're presenting it you know you need to you need to make it tasty you know, um, depending on the age, make it sexy or whatever, you know, that, but, or, and when I say sexy, I don't mean, you know, that, I mean, ma make it something that, that, that they would, that they would pay attention um, to, you know, um, wh whether it's whatever you're creating in your presentation, or if you're bringing someone in, or if you're doing a little video on your, on your laptop and then showing it to them, but make it exciting, make it exciting uh, and make them see themselves in it somehow. They need to, they need to connect with it because there's a disconnect with the, with the things that are older that um you know between that and and the younger people so if you somehow have them recontextualize it make them see themselves in it i think uh, and see how they can take this on as theirs and move it forward i think you might you might spark a little fire um but you could try that yeah, I, I agree. I just want to share as well, um, just being in the education field, it definitely depends on the age of the students. But I think um, also adding on to what you said, if you put yourself into it and kind of share your story and share why you're passionate about the music and uh, not only that, but also show the deep connection between maybe what they're interested in, you know, finding out what they're interested in and then showing the connection between what you're trying to get them motivated about and what they're already motivated about. Awesome, does anyone else wanna, wanna chip in or tap into that question? Great, well, thank you, Joel. We have a question in the chat. Um, the question is, can you say there's any connection between Jamaican music and African musical practice, practices, sorry. And this is from Perpy. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go again. <laughs> I'll go again. Um, but, well, there's a lot, you know, uh, a lot. So I, I think I was sharing with, with Jason before that I was doing something with, with Kumina. Now Kumina is a, is a, is a religious kind of ritual music. Um, so Kumina was is is actually post post slavery. Um, so after the abolition of slavery, there 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 were a group of um, indentured workers who were brought from Central Africa, and uh, and that's that's where Kumina came from. But even before that, there's there's other there's other styles of folk music, uh, and and also and and a lot of that folk music fed into the Nyabingi, um, the Rastafarian religion. And so, so those drums, a lot of the, the drums, and even some of the language that they use, it's, it's, it's Akan, it's, um, it's Chromanti, some different things like that are, are coming from it. So there's, there's a lot of connection. Um, I, would say, I, I would say there's, there's more connection 
with African roots in Jamaican music and others. There's Indian as well, and there's definitely British and 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 other types as well. Um, but but the the the, the the lion's share is it's coming from various parts of Africa. Awesome. Anyone else want to say anything to that question? Okay, great. Well, does anyone else here want to ask a question before we wrap things up? It can be about a subject we discussed today, or it can be a personal question for the individual panelists, feel free to ask. Um, Ashley Pierce had asked, there is the talk of this rossing machine effect and reusing older beats and styles, but how do you create an altogether new beat that's entirely unique? Anyone who wants to ask. Oh, we got some hands up. Um, David, you could go first or David has his hand up. Oh. <laughs> no, I had my hand up to say something else. I just wanted to say that I'm, as a professor at Berkeley, it just really warms my heart that we're having this discussion. Like, it just, this was not happening when I was a Berkeley student at all. And I didn't even know that there was a community of Jamaicans at Berkeley. You know, we were just all, we just kind of all blend in the general Black population at Berkeley and you know, we didn't, I, I didn't feel as comfortable to step into my Jamaican identity. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for organizing this and, and having this discussion. It's, it's really affirming. Thank so, you. So on, on, on the question, oh, and uh, thanks, David. Um, on the question, you know, there's a, I think there's a Sting album that's called Nothing New Under the Sun. Uh, and <laughs> and that, that's my answer to your question. There's nothing new under the sun, but depending on your com how you combine these various different things, um, it might sound new or it might be fresh. Uh, it might be far enough away from when it happened before that it sounds new and it sounds fresh. Um, but as long as it sounds fresh and new to you, that's all that matters really. So, um, you know, you know, start with what you have and and tinker around and play around until until your friends go oh that's cool you know it's <laughs> <laughs> i'm going to jump in here too and then i see we've got two other uh hands up um but this i'm just going to take a play uh, out of the the clark terry playbook for those of you who are musicians and you know clark terry was a renowned uh trumpeter and educator um played in the count basie orchestras and the duke ellington orchestra among many others and as an educator um, being in his clinics and master classes, he would point to people like Miles Davis and other artists, and he would say it was really kind of these three elements of what you do as an artist. One is we do the first thing, we copy. You know, our, our first thing as musicians is, is to imitate and imitate as much as we can. And then you begin to combine these things and you begin to assimilate these different things in different ways. And probably that's going to be the vast majority of our creative life as artists will be trying to copy, trying to get it as authentic as we can, as real as we can, trying to combine it in different ways. But it is those artists like Miles Davis um, and others that we've seen where the, that, that assimilation comes into that place of innovation where they, they end up creating something new. And in, in, in some artists' cases, it's, it's through collaboration. They get together with different people that they might not normally interact with and that ends up inspiring them and bringing them into a new direction. So I'm, I'm throwing that out there as my my thought on this. But um, um, Kendaya uh, Shepard, you, you had your hand up for a question and Ron, but I'm not sure if either of you had a, a comment on this question as well. Um, yeah, I had a, let me go back to the, um, I'm gonna think about the question. My question, I raised my hand because I heard you all talking a lot. I'm. Trinidadian, I'm Tobagoian actually, that's Tobago behind me. Um, so my aspect, when I went to Berkeley, I studied music business. And so you all are talking a lot on the creative side of everything. And I want you to kind of leave um, the aspect of the business side. So one thing I've been enamored with since I was growing up was kind of um, how reggae and dancehall was marketed and spread across the globe, both because 
um, we as Caribbean people settle in different places and also the industry that was brought up behind it. So can you talk about some of those things? For instance, I'm just gonna throw like VP records out there as um, what that, that part of the business meant as the music was getting um, exposed, how important that was to um, kind of keeping the Jamaican-ness <laughs> kind of through the pop industry as you went on. Okay, hi. Um, I, I would say that um, really the doors were flung open with Bob Marley and Jimmy Cliff and all of those people. Right, so they really did the pioneering work. Um, and then now, uh, when it got to dance hall, all these guys just pretty much just stepped on their shoulders. Right, um, yes, there's the, the admin side of it from, as you said, the VP records. And I know that some producers back in the day, like Steely and Cleavy and stuff, were doing things with Jive records. And, and stuff in the early days of hip hop. And through those connections, um, it helped to spread the music even wider. Yes, I'd like to add on to you when you, when, um, you asked that question because Bob Marley, a lot of people don't realize how influential Bob Marley really was on an international scale. Like I study ethnomusicology and I studied playlist curating world music, different um, um, countries of music playlists in the summer. And I used, I, I started doing New Zealand and I've been to New Zealand. And when I went to New Zealand, I was like, why in the world is there so much reggae music? Like how did reggae end up all the way on the other side of the world? Like Hawaii, all of the South Pacific has been like, that is their genre right now. Like they listen, they love reggae. And the, the deeper I dived into the roots of why and how they received reggae, it was from 1972 festival where Bob Marley was headlining. And just that one time he just performed, influenced the rest of that area of the world to just say, this is speaking to me in such a way. And we also want to produce this type of music. We also want to say these type of less, like lessons and, and history and strife that we're going through. And then when you add on this need to just find out what is this, what is this genre? What is this speak? What is this fight that I'm hearing in this man's voice and stories? you start to see those record labels come in and they're getting sent to this other side of the world. So now there's a push and there's a need to get this, this feeling, this urge to get this, this type of music. So Bob Marley started it, but because of all of these people who were record producers and label people and, you know, gunmen, some people had gunmen in the studio saying, if you don't put this on the record, st in the, in the, you know, the studio and the record labels and on the radio station, then we're going to fight, we're going to suit up the place. But all of this extra culture and background, you know, puts this whole music outside of places that in the smallest of countries, like we're talking about, like, even like, there's so many small countries like Fiji. That's one of the places I've been to. This one small country that's smaller than Trinidad, they they love reggae because of this one man showing up in New Zealand for like a day, <laughs> you know? So it's, I just, as a music business person as well, and a person who loves to study music, I think it's very important to understand how it happened, you know? and to look at the individual countries where the influence had reached and how this sound reached. Yes. And can I also add the influence of film, right? Music in film. Mm -hmm. So you had like the harder they come from the seventies. I come from a teacher. Right. And you have several yeah. other, other films that music was, that reggae music um, was played a major part in. So with that now it helped to spread the music and culture. Awesome. I want to make sure that we have time for Ron and Richard. They have their hands raised. Uh, Ron Reed, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Ron, we're not hearing you. Sorry. Ron, we can't hear you. If you like, you can type your question in the chat and one of us could read it as well. 
<laughs> it, might, it might be your Zoom settings, Ron, if you want to just check your Zoom settings. In the meantime, um, Richard RC, do you want to ask a question? Then we can go right back to Ron. Um, yeah, I just actually would like to make a, a contribution in, in terms of the conversation. Um, fantastic job, by the way. And um, this is truly amazing to, to, to see this panel and what's going on here. But I'd just like to add that, you know, uh, I believe um, when I came on earlier, I, I, I think David, was it David was speaking about um, the music or, or the influence of reggae through so many different um, um, gyra um, and how, uh, no, I, I don't think it was David, it was the other gentleman, uh, I forgot his name, um, but he was saying that we all want to um, claim it after someone else takes and try to build on it. But the thing is, if, if we, we can all recognize there's one thing, I, I believe, our, um, was it Ashley or yourself may have said it, our music is actually universal. It's a universal language. So really, actually, it belongs to the polis and the polis meaning all of us, you know what I mean? Um, so sound is just something that we don't have any control over. And it's such a wonderful thing to see that this universal language as um, was just spoken of in terms of how Bob was able to influence so many various countries. And today that influence is like you drop a, a pebble in a body of water and the ripples just go out, you know what I mean? And that's what music is. So it truly is amazing to see. And I, I think if more of us today in the state of other worlds, especially here in, in New York, where Ashley and I are, uh, and maybe some others on the line are, are from, you will find out that we can, we all see that we have a whole lot more in common than we have that separates us. That's just what I want to contribute. Do, no, you Ron, guys heard me, yeah? We did, Richard. Yeah. And Ron, we still, yeah, it was great. Thank you, sir. Ron, we still can't hear you. I'm so sorry. In the meantime, we do have one question in the chat for Joe Davis from Daniel Edwards. He says, This is for Joe Davis, who influences you and your music. So, Joe, if you want to answer that really quickly. Well, thank you for asking. Um, I have so many people that influence my music. I've been listening to so much so many different genres, so many different artists. You have like Stevie Wonder, Carmen Lundy, Earth, Wind & Fire, Luther Vandross, but then also like some of your more like nowadays mainstream people like Masega, your Jacob Colliers and stuff like that. But I always like to bring it back to the roots. Like I recently did um, a Burt Bacharach song. I'm gonna be doing a George Gershwin soon in the near future. Like Pharaoh Sanders, as, as, it's just so many different, amazing, influential musicians that just like help to define who I am as a musician. And George Duke is another one, a very, very another important one. Um, but yeah, just so many different people. And I just kind of, I, like, I love to listen to them. I love to like incorporate some of their ideas into some of the stuff that I do and like kind of decode it and find out how it works. So that I'm able to apply some of those um, theoretical based things in my own music and stuff like that. So yeah, thank you for the question. Hope that answered it. Awesome. Okay, John, uh, Ron is joining again, so we're gonna try him, and if well, let's just hope it works out. We I see Mijan. Mijan has a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mijan, do you wanna ask your question? Hi. Um, I didn't have a question as much as I had a contribution to the marketing, um, of reggae and dance. How a very big part of that is actually the swag, the personality. I mean, when we talk about Bob Marley, the way he influenced the whole world to be Rasta, the whole world to smoke weed, the whole world to wear Clarks, you know, Clarks is making a big comeback right now, and they're using reggae and dancehall artists to market um, in terms of the clothes that you wear, like, you know, everybody wants to be Shaba and wear the shiny shirts and, the, you know, the one foot roll up pants and, you know, with wasn't me, like everybody wanted to be that person that gaslit the girlfriend and was like, oh, yeah. That, that wasn't what you saw, you know what I mean? Like, it, what, reggae and dancehall made it cool to be Jamaican. Like, they, 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 they made the culture, um, like, mainstream. 
you know what I mean? Like everybody wants to be Jamaican. Like when you travel the world and you say you're Jamaican, everybody gets excited immediately, you know? So. Thank you, Ms. Ann. Yes, um, Ron, can we try you one more time? Yes, can you hear? Yay! Oh, okay. Got you. <laughs> okay, this is the same setup I use for teaching, so that's why I was so confused. I didn't change anything. Uh, just a couple of things. I wanted to say to, well, based on one of the things I wanted to say to David's comment, is that as a, I was a student in the 80s and I've always felt very comfortable in my Trinidadianness. Uh, even though I've been in a, you know, I was in the 80s when there was hardly any Caribbean uh, representation or recognition of the contribution of, of Caribbean artists to, the, to popular music. Um, but that, and, and that is what had driven me to this course that I teach right now, um, the history of the English-speaking Caribbean islands, um, has grown and is now, I find that, that when I started teaching this class, that students thought it would be an easy class, they'd come in, we talk a little bit about Bob Marley and talk about a few things and they'd get out of there and it really wasn't, um, it wasn't going to be challenging. And I found now, after doing it for some time, that the I see the topics that students are choosing to write about as final exams that have gone way beyond some of the things I even suggest because they are now seeing the influence and realizing the need to, to, to get very much more deeply into uh, into how the culture has been influenced and in turn re-influencing. Like we've talked a lot about the uh, uh, influence of, 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 of Jamaican music on, on hip hop music with, you know, when uh, uh, Cool Herc and so on. We talk a lot about about how, uh, I look at um, I'm on an exam, uh, 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 Alexander's an example in terms of his experience with all kinds of music. But we do that with the entire Caribbean. And I think what has been happening is that people keep telling me, I did not know this and I did not know that is and I think a big part of that is true because of the popular media through film we see these repeated images of what Caribbean music is like and what it sounds like and then when you start playing artists and you go back and playing some of the artists who don't get notable mention people start to see oh I'm now making connection I'm now making connection to this this singer at this period of time we talked about spewage when we talked about Bob Maiden music about People never knew that there was a music called Spooge. So I think what's been happening over the years is that uh, it's increased the awareness of the contributions of not just Trinidadians, certainly, but about Caribbean artists generally. But I've always felt comfortably in walking in that, in that Trinidadianness, David, and not, not felt that I needed to compromise um, anything. And also introduce that music to my hip-hop, uh, not my hip-hop, but my Afro-pop class. So I would always be pulling in an artist, even though we do the music in a different style. And it's all about letting students know, be aware that they have all these artists out there who are contributing to this world sound and have been interjecting their own taste and spin on it for many, many, many years. Also to add to David's, um, to, to Jason's point that I always talk about um, in the class is uh, the connections to older performers as students going back. You can't decide that you want to be a drummer and just learn a couple of beats if you want to be a reggae drummer. You have to go back and see what the ska drummers were doing and how it changed when it changed to rock steady and who the, who the musicians were part of those uh, rhythm sections. It's true that they got abused because a lot of those tracks were reused and reused and reused and they never got paid for them. But again, I point them in that direction to show that this was the sound at that time. And then it changed with um, reggae and Carlton Barrett and Rocksteady. And then it changed again with Sly and Robbie. And then it changed again when they moved to the Slang Tank time, where they started using just simply just uh, computerized beats. So you have to go back and do that retrospective in order to call yourself a drummer. So we always talk about those kinds of connections. And I know in a class that that's only two hours a week, you're trying to, to, to pump all this information. But what I've been seeing over the years, I've been doing this several times, is there's now an interest. Uh, people are just getting away now that they don't see when they talk about Caribbean music. The only person that comes up is either uh, Marshall Montano or Mighty Sparrow or Bob Marley. There's so many other pieces. There's so many other players and so many other people have been contributing to the development and trajectory of the music over the last, you know, 
50, 60 years. Thank you so much, You're welcome. Ron. Thank you for giving us that input. Um, we are over time, so we're going to wrap things up. But I just want to say a really big thank you, firstly, to the organizers, um, Evad Campbell, Sophia Leslie, Jason Camilio. Thank you all so much for just contributing to this conversation. Um, thank you to the panelists. Thank you so much, Joe Davis, Michael Sean Harris, Ashley, and OT. We really appreciate you all taking the time out of your evening to be here with us. Um, and then also thank you to Berkeley Global Initiatives and of course, SOCA for being the two organizations behind today's event. Um, and thank you to everyone who is attending and who chose to come out and be with us <laughs> this evening. We really, really appreciate it. I'm gonna hand the floor over to Jason, um, but yes, thank you all so much. And we hope if we do create something like this again in the future, that you guys will, will feel free to come out. Fantastic job, Ariana, Ivad, Safaya. This is super cool. And, and again, um, Safaya, I mean, uh, Ariana, how can folks um, follow uh, Soka, how can they follow you on, on social media? If you can throw that in the chat, that would be great. Um, your social media handles would be fantastic. And um, ladies and gentlemen, in, in literally about 15 minutes, Berkeley is going to be kicking off its 75th anniversary Diamond Jubilee concert. Um, it's going to be a virtual event, of course. Um, but you're going to want to maybe check this out. I'm going to throw this link in the chat. So if you're in for more Zoom or you want to just kind of put the music on while you're making dinner and hanging out with family and friends and all that at home, please go and check that show out. There's going to be some wonderful performances from across the Berkeley community, our campus in Valencia, Spain, our center in Abu Dhabi, and our campus in New York City. So feel free to check that out. And obviously some uh, special guest appearances from some amazing artists as well. Um, I also uh, welcome you to follow Global Initiatives. We're, we're so happy to work with uh, the students of Caribbean Ancestry and other groups around the community to bring sessions like this through Global Connections to you. And you can actually follow us um, online. We have a Linktree account and you can go to Berkeley Global uh, to check out the schedule of upcoming events and we hope to see you at those in the future. Wishing you all excellent health. Please stay healthy. Please stay safe. Stay connected and creative and we'll see you at the next session. Thanks everybody. Take care.